This is Talking Drupal, a weekly chat about web design and development by a group of guys with one thing in common. We love Drupal. Recorded live on Wednesday afternoons on a Google Hangout. Visit us at TalkingDrupal.com. This is episode 58, August 6, 2014. Today we're talking about Twig, REST, and designing in the browser. And we have a guest, Eric Baldwin. Welcome, everybody. Hello, hello. How you doing? Everyone is good, and we are all recovered from Design for Drupal over the weekend. More or so, less. So, with that said, I welcome in our first regular contributor, Eric. Uh, Eric. <laughs> Jason Pomental from HW Design. Hey, Jason. <laughs> hey, Steve. So, yeah. as one of the coordinators of Design for Drupal, which we just attended, how did things go? Um, I, you know, the feedback that I've gotten has been fantastic. Um, we had really good attendance. I think there was about 250 people there. Um, we had uh, great presentations. I think it was a really good focus. And our our new stuff, having uh, sort of a business focus day on Friday, I think was was pretty successful. So, um, all in all, uh, really proud of how it came together, and it was just a great team of people to work with. Yeah, it was a fun event to to attend. I did like the concept of you know day one being business focus, day two technical focus, uh, and design focus, and then day three being training and, and code sprints. So it was it was a great experience. So thanks for all your efforts. Oh, you're you're welcome. And and I, I'm I'm happy to report that I think we had uh, twenty plus people in the learning to contribute. Uh, session on Sunday as well, and we had somebody commit their, uh, actually as a high school student, commit her first patch, which was really awesome. And I understand she was 16, which is impressive. Yeah, yeah it was really great. That's cool. And we also have John Picozzi from Oomph, which was a sponsor of that event. Yes, one of our one of our top sponsors. Yeah, we uh, we were uh, happy to uh, do it, and as a first-time speaker, um, nobody threw any tomatoes at me, so I was happy about that. I had a good time, and uh, yeah, met a lot of cool people. Design for Drupal uh, was a big hit, in in my opinion. That's great, and rounding up the panel, we have Nick Laughlin from Enlightened Design, as usual. Hi, Nick. How you doing? Good afternoon. Uh, yeah, DVD was definitely great. Uh, having you know, having my own business, having a business track was definitely useful. Sometimes it's good to um, find out how other people uh, solve business problems rather than just Drupal problems. And then, of course, uh, being primarily a developer, I go to deeper. I look to D4D to kind of you know catch me up on some things that may have I may have missed uh, throughout the year and. I'm really glad to have Eric here because he had one of the more interesting discussions in uh, in his presentation. So I learned a lot about Twig as well. So I'm, I'm even more excited about Drupal 8 if that's possible. So Nick, you had a busy weekend, right? You had D for D on Friday and Saturday, and then your sister was married on Sunday. Is that right? Yes, my uh, <laughs> my baby sister was getting married. Uh, wow, great guy. So so uh, yeah, busy weekend. I uh, initially thought that she was getting married on Saturday, which, you know, I would have gone to the wedding rather than um, the conference, but I would have been a lot more, <laughs> a lot sadder, but thankfully we were able to get both in. That's great. So, and we have our guest today that we will introduce, and um, Eric Baldwin from, pulling up my notes here, hang on, from <laughs> <laughs> Cloud9Design, and that's spelled N-Y-N-E, Cloud9Design, um, which is um, controversially based in Oregon or Florida. Uh, he can clarify that. <laughs> we, we prefer to say we're from Earth. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Eric is a creative designer, a front-end developer, and a theming master. Um, he did a presentation, uh, actually involved in two presentations that I saw over the weekend. Uh, one was Intro to Twig, and the second one, I don't really know what the title of the second one was, uh, but is really our main topic for today, which um, he talked about front-end designing Twig and REST and how to kind of stick all those things together for a strategy moving forward. 
So his session was really intriguing. Uh, Nick and I attended it, and it really spawned us into this conversation today to to share what Eric's um, Eric's philosophy is and what his strategies are to uh, try to be better web designers and better Drupal people moving forward. And I'm interested to have him on today. Welcome, Eric. Well, thank you. Um, I'm glad to be here. And to go back to the beginning of the conversation, I would love to be a regular host if that ever is an opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we, we've been thinking about getting rid of someone, so maybe you could just step right up. <laughs> that person might be me. <laughs> Um, so, Eric, tell us a little bit. Um, I want to get into Twig a bit and into Rest a little bit from from a bit of a higher level to ground everyone in this conversation. But maybe okay. you could give us a quick synopsis of what the purpose of your session was on Saturday. And what was so intriguing about it was that, um, like a lot of Drupal, uh, unlike a lot of Drupal sessions that I've attended at camps. This one quickly turned into a, a really open conversation with the audience, uh, and it was fascinating. So maybe you could give us a synopsis of what that presentation, what the goal of it was, and how you felt it turned out. Sure. Well, um, the the point of having my presentation was to not, you know, list off some slides and introduce people to prototyping with Twig for Drupal 8 using the REST API, but to rather kind of discuss um, with a lot of other front-end developers at a design conference for Drupal. Um, a roadmap and a way forward to get designers, um, you know, outside of Photoshop and flat files into designing in the browser, you know, vetting responsive designs early and doing that with Twig to help facilitate, you know, the creation of a Drupal 8 theme. Um, you know, for those who aren't familiar with what Twig is, Twig is basically just markup logic inside of a template. Um, you're not going to be changing your data you know, you can't drop your node tables anymore when you create your caches like you can accidentally with PHP templates. Um, so it's a really, it's more concise. Um, it's a simpler way to have conditional markup around the data that you're, you're handling. Um, REST, on the other hand, is a way to get data that would necessarily be stored in a database. Um, and Drupal 8 has REST API calls built into it. So now, rather than using data um, what was the Drupal 7 data module, Fuse Data Sources, um, which is kind of broken and hacky. Um, you know, rather than creating a view and doing that, you can, in core now, say, I want this content type at this address and return JSON data when I pull it. So that allows someone like me, who's been doing designs in the browser and outside of flat files for uh, about four years now, um, to prototype with dummy data and then as a developer is working on a Drupal 8 site, um, inputting content types and getting content architecture together, I can then go pull the real data and use that inside of the markup of the front end layer. Um, so I, I want to stop you there for a minute and just, just focus on something that you said there that I think is really intriguing and important for people to understand. Let, let's talk for a minute about you said, does, you, you talked about you design in the browser, maybe you didn't say it specifically, but you're dealing with flat file data. So let's talk for a minute about designing in a browser. What does that mean? Um, I know Jason is a proponent of that to some degree, and, and I'd like to have a little discussion about what that means for people when we say designing in a browser. So Jason, did you want to go first? Sure. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, like Steve said, I, I think it can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, you know, in varying degrees. So, uh, you know, I'm, um, I'm definitely a huge proponent of getting into markup quickly. Um, I tend to kind of dip back and forth between, like, developing some initial designs in some kind of design program, like whether it's style tiles or, or in an early page markup, but then go into a Drupal theme actually right away. Um, sometimes into HTML statically, but usually into a Drupal theme. But And then uh, you sort of feel your way through a lot of issues once it's already in HTML and you can start to see how things behave. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the piece that's that's generally missing, and the reason why I often do it in a Drupal theme is is that you can then more easily have dummy data. And, and that presupposes a lot of things. Like, we have 
uh, core Drupal setup that's already ready to go. So we can all, like pretty quickly create content types and content, but that's not always the case when you have a, a larger, more distributed team. So actually having, like as Eric described, like a like a JSON file that actually has some content in it that's already structured, you could be working with that in a very real sense and and doing that in a way that is disconnected from Drupal, which, which I think probably offers some people some greater flexibility. You have to have less stuff available. Um, and it's, you know, I think it's maybe a little bit more freeing. So, yeah. Jason, from your perspective, you're getting in, you know, your design in a browser is going from, I know that you are generally doing style tiles, um, maybe doing some comps, but you, you're trying to get as quickly as you can into your theme. So when you say design in a browser, you're talking about you already have some content types set up and you're sitting in your Drupal environment. Um, right? much, much of the time. I mean, we, have, we also do some work that is actually specifically just to HTML and CSS because we're passing it off, you know, sometimes to multiple platforms. So in one project recently, it had to, the design had to span a Drupal site and a Ruby on Rails app for library search. So we had to create a, like a generalized set of HTML and CSS templates for a few different kinds of pages. And then we helped work it into Drupal, and now we're, we're giving them some advice on working it into the Ruby on Rails template. And um, so in that case, you know, technically, we weren't actually delivering Drupal stuff specifically at all um, until later on. In, in, in Eric's... The, the counter to that is Eric, which was what's intriguing to what I heard on Saturday was, uh, is him doing bra um, designing in the browser completely outside of Drupal, but Twig provided that mechanism potentially to do the design outside of Drupal and then potentially bring it in 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 the future into Drupal. Right. Is that yeah, right? So, yeah, so that's the beauty of using Twig outside of Drupal to build your prototype. Um, previously, you know, a lot of people are using Foundation or Bootstrap or, you know, insert other hot topic, um, you know, prototyping tool. Um, you know, and then you have to, because it's not compartmentalized already, you have to break apart those pages and create your templates for your theme out of that. But the very nature of Twig is that it's very extendable. So you can create a you know, component-based web system for your front end from the very get-go, and then have a view mode template for a specific content type. Um, so it's it's already compartmentalized and easier to translate into a Drupal 8 theme templating system. So outside of, the, um, I, I don't even know what Twig stands for, but um, <laughs> I don't think it actually stands for anything. No, it's just Twig. Okay. Yeah. All right. It's not an acronym. We have an acronym that that means nothing. Okay, and I guess it's not an acronym. <laughs> nope. So Twig is a tool that stands outside of Drupal that anyone can use and know zero about Drupal. Yeah, so it's uh, there's a PHP library as well as a JavaScript library. So if you're you know, a competent JavaScript developer but don't know PHP, you can also use it as a templating language. So what would be the advantage of someone using Twig that, let's say it's a front-end person, they don't, really don't know Drupal, um, the idea here is that they start to use Twig to develop their front-end templates. That way we can move them into Drupal later. What is a great way to get started in Twig? Even if you uh, don't know Drupal, uh, how would someone get started with Twig? So I, there I, are guess, a, I guess it's the same question if you do know Drupal. How do right. you get started? Um, so there are a couple tools out there already. Um, they're considered static site generators because of the way that they're built, uh, but they both leverage the PHP library of Twig. Uh, one of them is called Sculpin, and the uh, the web address for that is sculpin.io, spelled just like the fish. And the other one is Prototype, prototype with an N. Um, but they're both PHP-based uh, Twig templating engines, and the beauty of that is that you know Drupal 8 is using the PHP library for Twig. Uh, so if you do any extensions to Twig inside of your front-end framework, you can do that inside of Drupal as well, as well, which just translate right over. So it's not clear to me what those tools are doing exactly? Um, they're allowing you to build, you know, a static site um, or a prototype um, with, without needing MySQL, 
Um, you know, all you need is uh, Apache and uh, you know, a web server uh, set up locally so you can you can run through the files and extend things and create your template structure. So <clears throat> what's the what's the end goal with this process then? Is it to try to get other front end developers, you know, an introduction to Drupal or is it to kind of separate, you know, the typical Drupal theming from Drupal theming and bring it closer to the real world, I suppose. Uh, you know, what, what are you, uh, what so, are you looking So that's for? why um, the presentation was an open discussion format because, uh, you know, I've been, I've been using Twig to prototype my front-end designs for about a year now, and, uh, you know, I've just recently started messing with Drupal 8 and the REST API, and that, that light bulb went off above my head. And, uh, you know, I saw kind of a way to, you know, have a true headless system that's framework agnostic and, and leverage data from outside sources, be it Drupal or some other, you know, data formats. Um, but my, you know, there's a lot of problems to solve. The first one is probably to get designers into the browser. And an easy way to do that with, a, with Drupal in mind is to teach them with Drupal 8's theming system, which is Twig. Um, but yeah, there are uh, there are a lot of problems to solve that I'm trying to solve with this kind of tool and, and path forward. Um, but the first one is getting designers outside of Photoshop and flat files. Well, I, I think, I mean, that's that's a challenge that I think um, we've been trying to solve for 20 years. Yeah. And there's, I mean, that, that's 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 one issue. But but I think it's worth noting that um, one of the reasons why I. I Think Twig is such a big deal, is that it's not it's not Drupal. Twig is not Drupal. Mm -hmm. Twig is is outside Drupal, and and right. Twig is something that's in use in Pico, in Craft, in uh, in Redkite, um, Build, uh, a Bolt rather, um, mm -hmm. Sculpin. I mean, there's a bunch of other content management systems out there. Some more or less popular, some more or less robust, but they're all using Twig. And, yeah, and so we have really like this good. this external language that is, you know, easier for more people to get into. It's more robustly documented, um, and it's really simpler to work with than than Drupal's way of working with PHP arrays in the past. So I think it does make it more accessible to people um, without having to know like get so deeply into like how Drupal's internals work. Right. And as a designer, you know, it's it's kind of easy to pick up um, HTML and and the you know the elements and what they do, um, and not having to know PHP in order to now go design in the browser rather than diving into you know prototyping with Drupal seven. You have to know PHP at that point, and that's usually what I find a big hurdle and why everyone says theming Drupal is hard. You know, using the air quotes there. Yeah, I, and I think that that's actually a really good point because you know. I, I work with a lot of freelance designers, and um, finding a freelance a designer that knows Drupal is generally very difficult. Um, in even sometimes finding a designer that's capable of you know converting a style tile into something that resemble you know using HTML structure and, and CSS and SAS still isn't necessarily that useful because I still would have to take that theme. And then convert that to Drupal. So, and and it's a daunting task to, to, you know, work with a freelancer and be like, hey, I need you to basically learn how Drupal works and thinks and learn PHP and figure out how to override templates and you know you need to learn views and then you need to learn, you know, display suite X Y Z. You know, if we're able to move all of that to a theme layer that's headless or or semi headless, um, then it's a much more reasonable. Um, proposition to say, hey, I need you to theme the site. I'm going to build it. Here's the templating engine that you need to use. This great documentation. Use Twig. Um, and then, and then the ability, like you said, to provide kind of a, a a prototype that they can build off of that's in Drupal that feeds them information. Um, I, I would find that personally very valuable. Um, even if I'm not the one actually doing the design. I'm sorry, Nick. Oh, go ahead. I thought you had done that. I have a question about how close is Twig if I went to the Twig website from Sensio Labs. That's where it comes from. If I download a Twig from there, how different is that Twig from what comes in Drupal? 
you is it exactly the same? The am, am I learning the same stuff if I'm just going to Sensio and pulling it down? Yes. Yeah, the only thing that won't come from the Sensio Labs twig that you're going to download are the three or four filters that have been added to Drupal Core that help parse data. But other than that, it's it's the exact same template. Yeah. You know, Drupal 8 as a whole has been, we've adopted this whole mentality of leveraging technologies and systems and, and libraries that we don't have to maintain. You know, there's a whole separate community for Twig that's maintaining it and extending it. And, you know, that's the beauty of that is that now all the people who are maintaining PHP template for Drupal specifically can focus their efforts back on Drupal and not on something that was, you know, built elsewhere. So there's an important point there. If, if I'm a an agency that has a front-end developers, they could potentially be doing work in multiple platforms because I've now pushed them into Twig. Mm -hmm. So yeah. anything I do in Twig will absolutely work in Drupal 8, except there's a few more filters in Drupal 8 or features, we we'll call them, that, that allow us to interface with Drupal directly. But I'm not losing stuff when I move over to Drupal. Right. No, not at all. Um, and the, the, the things that were added inside of Twig, uh, the, those few filters, they would be pointless outside of Drupal um, because, you know, one of them is the without tag or, or filter and that you know, we don't really need to do that outside of the prototyping tool or I mean, outside of Drupal in the prototyping tool. All right, so, so let, let's talk about prototyping process a little bit, um, which takes us more to, I think, what your point was, is that if, if I'm a front-end developer... I'm designing in the browser, putting some templates together, and Twig allows me as a front-end developer to focus on the things that are important for the front-end side, which is the HTML and CSS. Mm -hmm. And I'm sort of not worrying as much about how the data is getting to me. I'm only worrying about the fact that there is data on the screen. Right. So from a strategy point of view, you're putting together a, a front-end and you're putting these blocks or these holes where you'll find a first name, last name, and address. Mm -hmm. And you're not worrying about where it comes from. Let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so um, one of the first things we do, you know, during the discovery phase on a project, and I'm sure this isn't specific to my company, um, we sit down and we actually analyze either the existing data on a website that the client has come to us with, or if it's a new project, we see what data we need to build for. You know, so it's a basic content architecture. Once we have that defined, um, I go create a, an outline, essentially, of the content type and its fields, and then you know, what specific settings I need to have, as in uh, formatters, image styles, things like that. Um, and then what I'll do in the prototyping side is I'll use a YAML file, um, which anyone not familiar with YAML, that's another markdown language like, um, like XML or you know, uh, JSON data. And what I'll do is I'll create those fields in an outline format and, you know, just start duplicating them. So if um, essentially client is one of the content types that will be theming in the front end, I'll create a bunch of clients, you know, and with their necessary data in that structure and then start wrapping that data in the appropriate markup inside of one template that just does one of them and then iterate through that data and duplicate that template for each client that needs to be output on the creator page. So now I have my view mode template all ready to go, and I can pull data from another source or go create that template file inside of Drupal 8. So when you say you can pull data from another source, is that a feature of Twig that you, you've got these sort of plugins? I'll, I don't know what the language is, but a plugin that says, hey, I'm going to pull the first name from a YAML file. Oh, no, instead I'm going to do it from a JSON file or I'm going to do them from a, a Commodore delimited file kind of thing? Right. So um, I'm not a PHP developer by nature. Um, mm -hmm. I actually made the transition from designer um, to front-end developer over the last decade. Um, but, yeah, uh, one of the a lot of these tools like Sculpin and Prontotype, uh, which are the two that I'm most familiar with, they have these uh, functions that have been defined in PHP that allow you to go grab data from an external data source or from a locally stored file. So you're able to use dummy data when you don't have external data sources, and then once you do, you can swap that out and change your, your variables that are in your market. Is that the point that you see the magic here? Yeah. Is that the layer in between 
you and Drupal can be swapped out mm -hmm. at some point. Right. And it doesn't even have to be between the prototype and Drupal. It's, you know, between the prototype, which can be the, the whole front end and whatever system is feeding the data. So by decoupling the prototype from any content management system, you could leverage data from multiple different frameworks, whether it be Drupal, WordPress, Joomla, um, a, an XML feed from the Weather Channel or any other XML feed. Um, so you could build your own RSS reader if you wanted to just by simply creating a prototype that pulls in this external data, uh, which is what I've done since Google Reader has uh, been able. I mean, that's something that I think has been, you know, like the phrase headless Drupal is one that, that has come up, but I, mean, I think more importantly, what, what Eric's describing is, is something that we're currently, the way he's prototyping this, it's loading the data from a YAML file, but you could just as easily supply a URL that would go and load that live set of data from a REST endpoint, which could be Drupal 7, it could be Drupal 8, it could be WordPress, it could be anything, as long as, as long as you know what the structure of that data is, and and that you're kind of figuring out in in the early stages of the project anyway by mapping out the content types and the fields and everything. So it might be a label change, but but that would be essentially it. Right. Yeah. Obviously, your your locally stored um, prototyping data is going to be you know a lot shorter. It's not going to have multi values, and if it does, you're going to you know iterate through them differently. Then Drupal's going to output them to you via REST and JSON or how. Um, so yeah, you're going to have to modify the way those variables are being output, but you're not going to have to change your templates. You're just going to change the way that you're calling. So this is where I, I see is a, an important point to make about this discussion is at this point, because I look at this, that this thing could go in two different directions. And one direction could be um, that I now have built these twig templates and I would ask myself the question of how could I take those templates that I've built in Twig and move them into the Drupal templating engine? Okay, because that's one approach, right? One is, and I don't know if you've, I'm looking for your feedback here on that and how easy is that to do? If you not know anything about Drupal and you've just sort of templated stuff, how mm -hmm. easy does that go into Drupal? Then the second point is then the headless approach, which says, you know what? I'm then, I'm going to keep my twig templates the way I originally designed them. I'm not going to try to get them into Drupal, but now I'm just going to try to interface with Drupal through this headless client. I think there's two different strategies here. Right. So let's talk about the first one first, if we could, which is, do you know how easy it is to move like someone who hasn't done any Drupal work into the Drupal templating structure, I would say using twig. Is that a difficult process? So, and, and could uh, it be automated? <laughs> Um, well, I'm not sure if it could be automated. Like I said, I'm not a uh, PHP developer. Um, so that's that's another reason why I had this discussion over the weekend at D4D, yeah. because it was my call for help to say, help me you know, plan this roadmap and, and build a tool that will do all this. But to answer the question, um, you know, translating from your Twig prototype into uh, a Drupal theme isn't too difficult. Um, if you're going from your Twig-based prototype to a Drupal 7 theme, you're going to copy most of your markup from what the browser is rendering rather than using your Twig templates. Um, although I think there might be a module, um, like that's the antithesis of Twigify and untwigifies a theme. Um, could be wrong. Um, but, you know, you're going to copy that markup into your tipple fit file and, you know, change the, the variables to be, you know, PHP output uh, print render statements rather than just uh, curly braces for Twig. But going from D, uh, you know, into a D8 theme, it's going to be a lot easier because you'll be able to take your partial file from your prototype and pretty much drag and drop it into your Drupal 8 theme and, again, just change the way those variables are output. You're not going to have to change the markup. You're not going to have to do anything else. Your extended systems will still work and things like that. So, um, going going to headless now. You know, we've mentioned this word a few times, um, and this is something I think is is a bigger issue that we need to solve and answer. Um, everyone has their own kind of conception of what headless is right now, um, and a lot of that. And I, I talked about this on Saturday as well. Um, using an MVC framework like Phantom or Angular 
you know, in a, in a headless format is really kind of, um, to be blunt, screwing the content administrator. Because now if I want to change a, the block layout on my page or if my Drupal site is using panels, um, how am I going to get that into Angular? You know, so we have content management in core, um, and it's CMI, which stores a lot of the data structures and content types and um, block visibility settings and, and things like that. Um, but I don't want to duplicate Drupal outside of Drupal because that doesn't make any sense. Um, so you know, headless, as I see it, is framework agnostic. It's something that we can pass configuration in. Um, we can still have whatever framework is being used or CMS is being used. Um, you know, we don't want to strip power from the, the clients that we're building sites for. Um, Cloud9's mantra always is, you know, if we you come to us, we build it, we give you the best product possible, we'll then train you on how to administer it on your own. And if you come back to us, that's great, but hopefully you're coming back to us to add a new feature to your site or to help train you in a new contrib module that you download and install on your site, not to fix a bug or to address something. You know, as severe as, hey, I put this block in this page, but it doesn't show up in my front end. What's wrong with my site? You know, that, that could be a, a, a really short, simple message from the client, or it could be, you know, hey, I can't change anything in my theme layer. I want my money back. So, you know, the headless, to me, is it's got to embrace whatever the back end is. Um, we're not solving any problems by, by removing power from the content administrators or user one for that case. I can imagine I, we've got some questions brewing. Yeah, this. yeah, I was going to say, um, <laughs> I, I think, well, I think mine's kind of quick. So, I think first of all, if you build a completely headless framework or headless, you know, front end like Angular, and then your client's coming back to you a month later, two months later, saying that they changed the block layout and it wasn't working, I think that that's a failure more on the project management and training end. And I mean, you you shouldn't be just installing a headless framework without telling your client well, who not having a really good reason or but how many really how many of your clients are actually going to be able to go in and write javascript or you know well, do their own html if you've got a small business they don't have an internal team sure but but i mean eric i think that um, i mean i don't disagree with you at all i just i sort of feel like the instances where i've heard about the notion of you know a quote unquote headless drupal is in instances where um, the way that Drupal outputs stuff on the front end going out to the client is not sufficiently performant or mm -hmm. scalable for the end requirements. And I think, you know, we're talking about, like, like the NBCs of the world, not, you, you know, the other 90% of, like, all the work that we do, that we would do in Drupal. So, I mean, I think, like, in those circumstances, then you know, Drupal's doing what it's great at, which is allowing you to model content, build build relationships between content, and then be able to serve it, but it's not being used for layout or, um, you know, or for ultimately the configuration of that front end, and that's much more rigidly defined. And I, so I, I think that that's almost a, a separate issue. I mean, I think Steve and I maybe differ a little bit in our opinion of whether or not Drupal's still useful in that circumstance. I totally believe that it is, right. but... Um, but I think it's a narrower set of circumstances there. Well, this is definitely why I've come to the conclusion, you know, I'm trying to solve way too many problems right out of the gate, um, you know, and I need to kind of focus on the first one, you know, being getting designers into uh, designing in the browser, but also, you know, getting them familiar with Drupal Yeah, and... So a, a point so, I want to make here, uh, Nick, sorry, is that I think the minute we step into the bounds where we're writing front-end tools that aren't Drupal that are reading the CMI to understand layout and configuration. It's like we're rebuilding Drupal to some level. And I'm, that's the area that I get concerned about. And, and if we say that we're doing headless work and which makes sense to me, and, but we're also interfacing with the CMI to just, I'm not quite getting why we wouldn't take that front end stuff and move it into Drupal. I'm I'm missing what the benefit is 
a little bit. I totally see, which is, I totally see why Twig is important and designing in a browser is important. But the minute we start writing extra tools that start to interpret the CMI and do things different, I'm wondering where the value is. Right, and that's something that a lot of people are doing in Drupal 7 right now. Where they're using Angular to prototype their front end. Right. And then they're working with the Angles module in Drupal uh, to, to make basically their Drupal 7 theme and Angular served app. Um, so, you know, I, I, I see that you know, some people, after doing a prototype, uh, may not want to take the time to learn um, you know, how to integrate it as a Drupal 8 theme. Um, but if that happens, you know, I don't want to go the way that Angular's gone with Drupal 7, where it's removing a lot of the power from um, the end user. You, you made a point about, like, Angular and your approach on Saturday that we haven't touched on today, and that one is server-based and one is client-based. Could you talk mm -hmm. about that for a moment? Um, so AngularJS um, is a way to kind of build your own HTML elements um, and leverage partials just like you can inside of Twig natively. Um, and it runs on a client side. So it's it's interacting with the page as an app rather than having multiple smaller separate apps on an HTTP page you know, uh, served by Drupal. Um, Angular really likes to bootstrap the entire page and make everything an Ajax request. And the first so, so basically the page uh, is a block of data right that's right. coming down from the web server mm -hmm. right. so angular likes to kind of grab the whole thing and do what it wants with it um, and if you you know uh, Google and SEO they don't they don't see those sub paths because it's all an angular uh, front end and you know Google right now doesn't process any of that so you have to do some really weird um, things in the back end essentially of your code to make sure that Google sees, um, you know, the data for what it is at a sub sub path. Um, I mean, does that answer kind of what what you're asking? Yeah, about it, it, it does, and it, it it does. I just want to touch on that point in that, you know, solutions that are JavaScript based that are going after these headless strategies are all client based solutions. Mm -hmm. What you're talking about with Twig and the headless side. I believe is more of a server-based solution. So the end user is actually going to get delivered a well-structured HTML page mm -hmm. with all the benefits that you would get from, you know, for SEO and everything else, as opposed to some of these other headless strategies that are just coming from the client side. Right. And the beauty of Twig is that you can also use uh, client-side NBC with Twig. Um, there's nothing stopping someone from doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you do want to Ajaxify your site or use some kind of um, you know small app in the sidebar to submit a poll back to a, a backend framework, you can do that with Angular, no problem. Um, but my my biggest uh, personal problem with JavaScript MVCs on the client side is that they really like to um, make the whole page an app, and I see that as a big limitation. Yeah, I mean that that's that seems to bring with it so many challenges and and issues for for end users for compatibility for SEO. Um, I mean, this Drupal's generally, you know, the point of it is to deliver a web page, mm -hmm. deliver a website. Right. Yeah, and uh, you know that's why I'm kind of talking about leveraging CMI because a lot of people, um, you know, in my experience, uh, most recently in the last six months, you know talking to people about Headless and Angular and, and Drupal 7, um, they're leveraging their Angular prototypes as the HTTP layer for their Drupal sites, rather than taking all of that markup and logic and then backporting it into a Drupal 7 theme. So, you know, that's why I'm kind of talking about leveraging CMI, because I've seen people not go back to Drupal after starting outside of it. Um, but again, I don't want to duplicate Drupal outside of Drupal, because that doesn't make any sense. Um, but maybe Drupal 9 will just be a framework that will only have an administration side and no theme layer at all. And then we'll have to have something that leverages all these configuration files. But that's a discussion for next year. So I, I just want to take a step back again because I'm still, maybe I'm just hung up on this. Um, and maybe it's just the difference in our clients. Um, one of the use cases that you mentioned was you don't again you don't want the disconnect between the back end and the front end um, 
if somebody adds a new block or adds some new information, and you, they should see it. I mean, I, I typically don't, or or they download a contrib module and it doesn't show up. Um, Right. When I'm when I'm working with an agency, I, I there's some level of expectation that you know they, you know they'll configure the site, they'll add code, they'll add modules, they'll add blocks, panels, whatever. Um, but by definition, they generally do have development resources to kind of handle some of that stuff. I, it's not often that I have end users that would be installing modules or cr changing the layout now. I, I mean, a, there obviously panels exist, and one of the reasons why it exists is because clients want to be able to change layout. But that's um, that's a smaller subset. What what kind of clients do you see really need that kind of level of control? Building um, some newspaper websites and publications. Um, you know, those are very dynamic sites. Uh, I did an Angular prototype for a publication last year. Um, and, you know, three quarters of the way through the process, um, you know, they kind of gave some change requests and then I started migrating to a D7 theme. But, um, you know, that, I think that's where the disconnect is too, like uh, migrating to back to Drupal once you've decided that your prototype is, is stable and the design that you want, you can stop there and not have to leverage any of the configuration if at that point you go back to a Drupal theme with that code. Um, but if you don't and you start leveraging REST and all that, that might be a better use case for a brochure site or some site that's not going to have you know dynamic markup or things on different pages that need to move around and change. Um, so it's definitely there, there are a lot of different use cases, but you know going back to Drupal is is kind of the point of this is that we're building some front end theme layer outside of Drupal because learning Drupal is too cumbersome for someone who's not familiar with it. Um, so let a developer do that and create the content structure and all that, and then use that data um, that I've duplicated the content architecture in um, inside of the prototype. Um, but at some point, you know, to keep the dynamics of Drupal inside of that, you have to go back to a Drupal theme. Okay. Hmm. I, I want to touch on something that uh, we haven't touched on at all, which is just Twig in general and Drupal 8 um, and what the benefits of Twig are bringing to Drupal 8. So it's a little bit outside of this discussion, but with no experience on my part yet, it's my understanding that Twig is giving us the capability to con completely control the HTML that's generated from a Drupal website. So if I install a module, and it's generating some content for me that I'll have control over that content in Twig completely and and I can remove all those nested divs and those things that show up that I don't want them to and I can do it at the Twig level and don't need to jump into modifying what the module is doing. Right. And, is yeah. that true? Well, there's yeah, an so important thing to add. I, okay. Just before I let Eric go, because he knows <laughs> way more about it than I do, um, it's not about removing the stuff. Right. It's about the fact that it's never going to be there in the first place. Exactly. That's what I was going to say. You know, right now, hopefully, um, by the time we have a stable Drupal 8 release, we don't have the dividers that we've had before. I, I know Morton has been doing everything but jumping off of bridges to get all those extra divs outside of Drupal. Um, the fact that, you know, if we have a field in Drupal 7 and it's allowed to have multiple values or unlimited values, we always get the field wrappers, even if there's only one value. That's ludicrous. And, and Morton's been, you know, raising his fist for a long time to, to get rid of that. So I think by the time we have a stable release, we won't have to worry about modifying uh, and removing so much of the markup um, like we were used to having to do from uh, breadcrumb or views plugins or, you know, any other type of verbose uh, developer written, not designer written, front-end code. Um, so, so in today's world, I install Drupal and then I install modules that allow me to remove stuff from the content that's generated. So those days are going to be over? Well, I mean, there will still be use cases where you probably want to modify it. Um, but in that sense, you know, if you know the markup that you want, you can very easily 
uh, you know, pre-process and, and throw in another template. Or you, you may not even have to pre-process by the time you have a beta or a stable release. Um, but I, I assume you're talking about things like fences or right. display fences, suites. Fences, semantic like views, display semantic suite. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, so we're, I don't, I don't th see us, um, you know, in Drupal 8 having a need to use those modules. Um, it's going to be so easy to actually do on your own inside your theme. I mean, there's there's some some of this I think is probably going to survive, and that's just tailoring the markup inside the views output because that right. that's that's kind of unavoidable. But that's mm -hmm. also been pretty well sorted out in terms of like, especially if you look at the you know in Drupal 7 with semantic views, mm -hmm. you've got pretty complete control. Not not entirely, but but pretty close. Um, and I, I think that is all conceptually there in, in Drupal 8. It's everything else, though, where... So, I was going to ask, I haven't way. used semantic views since Drupal 6, uh, because ctools in D7 allows us to change uh, both the field, the field wrapper and the field and label wrapper. Um, so what exactly does semantic views in D7 and views right now do? That, uh, the rows HTML element. Oh, okay. Well, see, I, that's where I usually drop into a template. <laughs> well, and and so that's... Um, I mean, that, you know, what the goal is, I, I think, with something like that is to not have to write templates all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that's... And so being able to say, like, all right, I'd like this to be a list of articles... And I can go through with my set of checkboxes and say, "Don't use my field templates." You know, it's like just right. eliminate all that. I just want this. I want this wrapper around here. And I, you know, it's the the thing that's difficult in Drupal Seven is knowing specifically which modules adding which piece of it. But it's you know, it's C tools, fences, semantic views, and um, HTML five tools are kind of like the ones as far as views is concerned, and then display suite when it you know comes to like sort of styling a view mode. Without all of those, then you know we are in that land of having to write template files and preprocess functions. But um, the Node array and all of its other stuff that comes out now has things like um, I want the this field dot attributes. Mm -hmm. And it echoes out specific stuff. That's the thing with Twig. That's going to be so great. And yeah. um, I mean, I had the chance to give the sort of introduction to Twig talk that that you wrote with Forrest, I believe, um, and gave in the Twin Cities camp. Um, so that was a good learning uh, experience uh, for me. Chicago mid camp, not, not Twin Got Cities. It. Yeah. I was um, this year in March. Some somewhere west. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I've got a question. Related to this is is in today's world in Drupal seven, if I focus on template writing, can I get the same results as we're talking about that I get very clean markup? If I'm just going to handle everything through templates today mm -hmm. in Drupal seven, that I could get extremely clean markup. Yes, absolutely. Yep. Right. Okay. So that's, that's what I knew, but I just wanted to state it. <laughs> so, so, but my next question is: So, how does that change in Drupal eight? It's is it really no different? We just have a different method for creating the templates. Oh, no, it's yeah, um, it's it's um, but the same fundamental um, idea. You know, you're going to change the markup in a template file. Right. Um, you know, and you can still change it in the UI as well. So the thing is in Drupal seven when you look at the PHP array for the content on the page, it has all of these fields in it that already have embedded HTML. And if you want to get around that, then you have to pick your way through all the other elements in that array and find the one that you want, make sure it's been filtered. Um, but it's uh, there's, there's a whole lot more overhead for what you've got to do, whereas with Twig, none of that embedded markup will be there in the first place. So you're just pulling out the data that you want to display and wrapping it with whatever markup you want. Mm -hmm. So you're undoing less. Like, that's the thing. Like, in, like, messing with the search form. I, th I think that's probably a pretty good example. You know, messing with the, the, um, the search form is just horrifically difficult in 7. You've got to have pre-process functions coupled with a template file and maybe like a sacrificed chicken or two 
and, <laughs> and a hook form alter, and, uh, and yeah. Uh, yeah, it goes on and on and on. Right, and, and none of that stuff is actually going to be there in 7 because it's, it's just data. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions? I don't know. John's been like up here? stuck on mute there for a while. I've been, I've been, I've been listening intently, and I'm, I'm still interested in hearing more about about Steve's Steve's philosophy on not needing Drupal um, if you're or for editing content with with the, under the theory of headless Drupal. Sure, and this comes back to a debate we had um, later in the evening on Saturday night at the after party. <laughs> when alcohol was <laughs> all, right. all the best debates. That's too. right. And, yes. And Bombay was sponsoring that event, so let's just put that into context. <laughs> 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 no, but it, it's it's something that I still feel passionately about, so I'm willing to talk about it today. But so the point I was trying to make, which was cl very unclear on Saturday night, was. And it spawned from the discussion we had on Saturday, which um, if, if I'll just say, Eric, if Eric came to his approach here and was using Twig outside of Drupal and he was not using any CMI, didn't care about block structures or any admin configuration, and all he was doing was going after the REST API and grabbing nodes from Drupal, I think that it's wasteful to use Drupal in that scenario. Because, and I would absolutely agree. Because I could write a much more clean and faster way to maintain records, and I don't need all the overhead that Drupal brings. So, Is that, and when people come at Drupal from these other, you know, client side solutions, Angular, a backbone, and then not paying attention to what has made Drupal great, I think it, it's it's very wasteful in terms so, of what Drupal provides. That was the point I was trying to make, and hopefully it's clearer now than it was on Saturday, but that's the point I was trying to make. Yeah, and I agree with that, too. You know, If, only, if you're only going to be, um, if you don't need to change your front end or you don't have really a lot of dynamics on your site, just use a static site generator. There's nothing wrong with Jekyll or Sculpin, so, even using Pronto type in that sense. Um, if it just site's just going to be content types and data. So to clarify, Steve, are you talking about from a development standpoint? So developer is editing content. Or are you talking about from a client standpoint? Even a client standpoint. I mean, it's not very hard to write, and we've done it. Write CMSs for a customer to go in and maintain some basic records. Uh, that generate content. I mean, I don't know listen, about listen, that. Don't take that and explode it to writing big, complicated systems. We're trying to, but we're talking about a headless client. I mean, so all yeah, you're but doing is grabbing my, basic I, records. My first, my first, yeah. my first thought about a headless client is sim. <laughs> Just stopping there, leaving it at that. Just um, oh man, I, I got a lot of thoughts that just popped into my head. Um. No, but I mean, it, the first thing that pops into my head when we talk about headless Drupal is really like building building an app or you know a, a web app or some sort of some sort of app that is that's you know driven by Drupal but not necessarily using Drupal as a display mechanism. I think that's a great example, John. I think that if you're writing an app, right? If you're writing an app and all that's all you're delivering is an app. And you're using Drupal as the back end to deliver that, it's probably not a great approach. There's I don't probably I, better I, I ways totally to do that. disagree. I, I can't agree well, with that because I and, here's, as well. and here's and here's why. <laughs> here's why I, I here's why I can't agree with that. I've waited until minute fifty five to open my mouth. But um, if you you know, you have A, you have clients that aren't familiar with with coding, but you're saying you're gonna code a, a CMS from the ground up in PHP to to satisfy this client's needs. No, no, John. I said that's one example. There's lots of other solutions to do this. If all your if all your endpoint if all your goal is to create a single endpoint for a user, I mean, there's lots of other solutions out there other than Drupal. Yeah, I think I think I can see what um, yeah. Steve's saying here. You know, if you're if you're only making a blog that's ever going to have a blog title and a body and your name as the author, 
there's no need to install Drupal. Right. Um, but I will agree with everyone else except for Steve on the app <laughs> instance, where if you're building an app that is dynamic, you have to have a framework behind it. Um, managing an app in static files is just unmanageable. Here's here's my, my my thinking is like I I, I agree with Eric in, in both of those examples I think if obviously if you know you're not going to use a uh, you know machine gun to go to go bird hunting right you, you're not you gonna I mean you, you can more birds that way you you can there are people that have done it but I think you can fish with dynamite in Michigan. Yeah, so there you go. There's a better there's a better analogy, right? You know, fishing with dynamite is not. Never mind. Both of those analogies are terrible. Anyway, um, you know, I think the, I think the point here is too. Obviously, you're going to look at your functionality. You're going to look at what base set of needs, you know, the client or requirements the client has. But I think in more cases than not, Drupal is going to Drupal is going to be helpful to you. Um, granted, you're not going to use, you know, it, it, the way Drupal's going is kind of half design, half half content architecture, content structure. You know, you're not going to use the the design, appearance, front end theming side of Drupal. I, I, I get that, but I think when it comes to the content editing side, there are a lot of features within Drupal, a lot of a lot of modules that you can add to make content editing a lot easier for your client. And to create a pretty pretty nice admin for them to be able to admin their their app or or whatever whatever you know they're using it for, and I think that's really where the power comes in is, mm-hmm. oh I need to add an image oh now I need to add a link oh now I need to add a table you know, it's never it's never as simple as you think it's going to be and and you I know think what, John I hear what you're saying but I I would never I've, it's one of the first times I've heard that Drupal could be a nice admin unit user interface for people. It's it's adequate, but it's not a perfect admin interface. Well, That's but it's really better than nice. having none at all with a static site generator. Yeah. Well, but I also think that you know, Steve, what you can't gloss over is that in uh, Drupal's really good at helping you model complex content and relationships, and and the admin interface for that, complicated or not, does exist and is quite usable. And in order to be able to give someone the ability to, I mean, let's let's take um, like a music example. We've got like artists and concert dates and concert venues and songs and albums. All of those things you could model in Drupal in a day and have all the relationships present. Now, wh- how you're delivering that, whether it's going into a music app or going onto the website, you could do both or, or one or the other. It doesn't matter, but but to build all of the tools to manage that, like you're not going to do a better job than what Drupal already has out of the box. You're not going to catch all the edge cases. You're not going to be able to make it multilingual. You're not. I mean, it's just like I think that's why we all started using Drupal in the first place. And I, I think that that's easily 50% of the value is that side of it versus the the front side. I mean, I still use it for making websites, but. But then you can still, through these other technologies, then make this the content that is supplied to um, the screen on your watch or the the info in your app, and and then have all these things kind of interact. Yeah, that's well, really right. been like, the last few years that we haven't had to build native apps. You know, um, you had to build a native app previously because this REST web services wasn't even around. Um, but now, if you don't have to utilize hardware, you can a simple website with you know uh, a specialized UI for a specific device size is is more than sufficient. Well, I mean, and I'll let Steve kind of confirm or deny this, but I think I think his point is though that it's for it's for simple content entry and, and record keeping. It's not meant. He, I don't think he was saying he could build a CMS that handles really complex workflows or relationships or you know, logic. It was really just if you're if you just have a you know a simple site that has information that needs to be served, it's very easy to build a better system. Yeah, I just think we get past that really really quickly. And and I mean, if I'm just thinking about a lot of the things in a typical website that we work on, um, in terms of asset management and content relationships and workflow controls and um, you know all these other things, those are all about back-end stuff way more and, and content management and administration than they are about what's what's on the front end. 
I mean, I agree that there's but there's lots of issues in making it like a JavaScript based front end. But I think that um, the big value in Drupal that's that's the thing that I, I was disagreeing with you the most about on Saturday and still today. I think that in more situations, it's still really valuable to to use that side of Drupal. Okay, so we'll agree to disagree. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure Fair I can, enough. Swip, I'm not sure I can, I can explain this any further. <laughs> I, I think we're probably still still talking about two slightly different things, and that's yep. okay. Right. I just want I just want Steve to, to say that Drupal's the best solution for every project. <laughs> exactly what I thought you wanted to hear, and I'm refused to say it. <laughs> <laughs> I think anyone who's been using Drupal for more than I don't know a week would uh, would not say that. <laughs> All right, so let's uh, let's wrap up the show here. We always end with a module of the week, and we have a very interesting one this week. And often, when a guest comes on, we ask them if they have a recommendation for a module of the week. And Eric had one, and it's probably the most valuable module. <laughs> that we've ever had in our almost 60 episodes. Would you well, agree, I Eric? The, well, I think it's your first novelty module. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which was what made it so appealing, by the way. <laughs> so how about if you tell us about it? Um, sure. So uh, Little Helper is uh, the module of the week. Um, anyone who's used MailChimp knows that uh, Chimpy up in the top right is uh, a bit of a smart ass at times. And we like that um, because, it, you know, it distracts us from the mundane. It gives us something to do. Um, and it's just kind of there, just like Clippy used to be. Um, I don't know how many times I would uh, pretend my mouse pointer or cursor was a, a you know, sort of punch in the face for Clippy. Um, but it's a way to just kind of distract you. Um, but yeah, Little Helper is configurable in the admin UI of Drupal. Um, you can give it random messages, but uh, just kind of appears in a block and shows up. There's no real contextual management for the messages. Um, so it is pretty much just a Drupal replacement of uh, Chimpy for MailChimp. Eric, I can't help but ask you if how many sites you've used this in. Um, well, uh, I haven't <laughs> used it in any production sites, I'll tell you that much. Right. Um, but I have thrown it in on a couple developer sites uh, while we're just going along when, you know, 80% of the work is done, and we're trying to squash the last 20% of bugs, and everyone's getting angry and stuff. You give them a way to vent so that they don't vent on a client call. I, I feel like this is something that should go into production on the Talking Drupal website. <laughs> yeah, I was, th I, was thinking that, I was thinking that as well. Eric, Eric this is also a free, free, you know, a, a judgment-free zone. You don't have to lie. We know that you're, you're putting those on production sites, but only for certain roles. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I would love to find out that that is on NBC's <laughs> Angular data production <laughs> site. Just, that would be amazing. They can't see it because it's not in the NBC framework. <laughs> All right, so I think we're we're just about a, a little over an hour. Let's call this a wrap. Eric, I want to thank you on behalf of all of us here for coming in today and spending some time with us and taking our questions to you, and uh, we hope to have you back in the future. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I look forward to being a guest or, you know, being a permanent member of the team. Exactly, and hopefully you don't take my seat. We'll see. <laughs> well, I don't know. Apparently it's going to boil down to either you or John that I'm going to take over for. Right. So. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, Eric, where can people find you online, and do you have any events or things that you're attending in the near future that you'd like to tell people about? Yeah, so um, Pacific Northwest Drupal Summit is coming up here in October. Uh, this is probably not the appropriate time for the dates to escape me, but uh, pnwdrupalsummit.org. Um, sign up, $55, um, submit your session, and uh, hopefully we, we'll see everyone there in Portland, Oregon this year. Um, I can be found around the Internet as Cloud9. I believe that's in my bar there. Um, and on October 17th to the 19th, by the way. Thank you, Jason. Uh, yeah, that is two weekends before bad camp. So if you're going to Amsterdam, you've got a week to come to Portland and then another week before bad camp. Um, so it's the trifecta of Drupal events in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, on, on the Internet, I can be found as Cloud9, uh, most everywhere, or Cloud9 Design. Um, on everything Drupal, I am Bladwin. Uh, so swap the L and the A in my last name. 
uh, and we can all thank Mike Anello for that. I just want to uh, say really quickly that it's actually three weeks before bag camp uh, because two weeks after Pacific Northwest is nude camp. Ah, right. They don't. They do not overlap. <laughs> Okay, I think I think I think uh, Bad Camp has been a bit of a moving target, right? It has. That's why. So we didn't have dates. <laughs> we, we wanted to have dates for PNW at uh, DrupalCon Austin, and it was I think Tuesday of DrupalCon, and I have, I'm finally like, has Bad Camp decided? Okay, they have. Good. Let's choose a date. Um, so we we got that released. But yeah, um, when Bad Camp decided to move their dates, that kind of messed messed us up because we didn't want to overlap or be too close. Yeah, well, it's it's now it's now even later. So the latest dates posted for Bad Camp are November sixth to the ninth. Yep. Okay. Yeah, and that's a week later than what I think it used to be. Right. Okay, Jason. Um, cool. Well, I'm actually not traveling anywhere in the next week, which is awesome. But in in a couple weeks, I'm going out to do a responsive typography workshop for front end masters at the end of the month down in out in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, and then if you're if you're not there in person, then you can find me at Jay Pomantel pretty much everywhere else. And how about you, John? Uh, I got uh, I'm, I'm going to be working hard at the UMF offices for the for the month of August. So nothing nothing really going on for me. But you can find me everywhere at John Picozzi or always on at umfink.com. Not true, my friend. Not true, my friend. What are you coming up next week? Next week in Providence. Oh man! Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> wow. There is there is that. Uh, next week in Providence will be the uh, Drupal PVD meetup. We're doing a mentoring mixer, so uh, come with your Drupal problems and get Drupal solutions. Or if you're a Drupal whiz, come and help somebody out. All right, great. How about you, Nick? You can find me at Nick's Man pretty much everywhere online and. Uh, I got another busy weekend this uh, this coming weekend, but I have to say one of the things I'm really looking forward to is the Talking Drupal Barbecue, although I think that's invite only, so oh. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need our fan base just showing up. Yeah, I was going to mention that, is that uh, the most stressful event in the house right now is my wife trying to figure out that she's got people coming over and she doesn't really know any of them that well and wants to make sure they spend three or four hours here and have a good time. So uh, we are having a talking Drupal barbecue this Friday night. So, uh, and listeners are not welcome, but, um, oh, you, know, what about guests? You, know, guests? you know, after all these years that we've all known each other, our spouses are all getting together. I'm not sure this is actually a good idea, but we'll see how it goes. <laughs> well, they'll have something to talk about while we're talking about Drupal. It's a great idea for them. Not a good idea for us, but we'll see. Uh, they certainly will. So, uh, everyone, thank you. I'm Stephen Cross, and you can find me online at Stephen Cross on Twitter or parallaxinfotech.com. And uh, talk to everyone next week. Cheers, everyone. Once again. See you next week. Thanks, Eric. Bye bye.